Uh, Hebrews is one of those you should study intently. Uh, Romans, another one. And, uh, of course, the three books that really are showing the superiority of the New Testament <coughs> system over the Old Testament system would be uh, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Hebrews particularly. <coughs> And I thought I'd just continue what I'd started Sunday. The uh, primary reason being I still hadn't finished uh, Minor Prophets, <clears throat> but I left my Bible I had <laughs> on my notes. So, so anyway, <clears throat> we'll get that next time. But we had talked about, <clears throat> uh, you know, the uh, who was the author of of uh, Hebrews, and we've quoted a number, a number of different uh, sources, very ancient sources, and we said that that uh, the uh, Eastern churches, and there was there was a division there. The Eastern churches had uh, readily accepted Paul as the author of Hebrews, whereas the Western churches did not. And Western churches didn't oh, accept it for a couple hundred years after the Eastern churches had accepted it. <coughs> and <coughs> after that, then we looked at some other reasons as to why we think Paul was the author. <coughs> and other than the fact that the early, quote unquote, church fathers, for the most part, had uh, accepted Paul as the author. Uh, and I'm quoting from uh, Milligan's book, which I know that uh, Lynn, I don't know if you just bought it or you had it all along, but anyway, yeah, Milligan's book, which is a very good book on that. Some things in it you have to be careful about, but I, I can point those out when. Uh, time comes, uh, but he says uh, one of the reasons that we think Paul was a writer is that it's a corroborate, corroborated by the internal evidence. <clears throat> uh, now you can't take this as conclusive, but uh, only uh, perhaps persuasive. And he said uh, many critics say that it was not. Paul could not be called because of the internal evidence. And uh, <coughs> Aiden, Aiden, <laughs> wake her up. <laughs> I, I was talking about Lynn, I wasn't talking about you. <laughs> anyway, because of the internal evidence, uh, you know, it, it's probably conceded that that uh, uh, Hebrews, in some respect, is a, is different than Paul's other writings. But that, in itself, <coughs> is not uh, uh, completely persuasive that it was not Paul. Or Paul was not the author, because a lot of it has to do. With, you know, the, the style of writing has a lot to do with the subject matter. Uh, the uh, message that's trying to be trying to be gotten over to the uh, the auditors of the, the book. Now, <clears throat> it is generally acknowledged that Moses wrote Deuteronomy as well as Leviticus, but no one says that the style of Deuteronomy and the style of Leviticus are anywhere near the same. And it's apparent that they're not. But the purpose of the two books is entirely different, even though Moses wrote both of them. So the uh, purpose and intent and the focus uh, of the book has a lot to do with the style of writing that uh, uh, that you find in, in that particular book. <clears throat> uh, 
And we see that uh, uh, style of an author, or where the style of any writing, the author is going to try to conform that style with the uh, nature and character of the message that he's trying to get over. And that's what uh, is being done in, in uh, Deuteronomy and, and uh, Leviticus. And I think it's, that's what's being done in, in Romans and Hebrews. They're different. But what they're trying to get over is, is different. So just because the style may be a little different in Hebrews than, say, Romans, is not conclusive proof that they were two different authors. It's, it just... You can't make that uh, blanket assumption. It's uh, further alleged by some, anyway, that <clears throat> that uh, uh, neither Paul or any other apostle could have written a letter because it's, if you go to uh, to the second chapter, verse four, <coughs> says that the author, the author says that the things pertaining to the great salvation had been handed down to himself, <coughs> excuse me, and those contemporary, and his, by his contemporaries, by those who had heard the Lord Jesus. Well, <coughs> that is not really a good argument against the authorship of uh, uh, Hebrews by Paul, <coughs> because Paul <coughs> uh, did not actually hear the Lord Jesus as did the other apostles. They actually were with him for two and a half, three years. Paul only heard Jesus on the, as he was on his way to Damascus, so he could uh, quite well have written this uh, verse in, in chapter 2, verse 4, and it'd be entirely correct. Uh, so he also says in the sixth chapter, Arthur says, wherefore, leaving the, the first principles of the doctrine of Christ, <coughs> let us, you know, plural, let us go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, or of faith towards God, and the doctrine <coughs> of baptism, laying on the hands, and so forth. And this we, again plural, we will do, if God permit. Uh, but this is a style of writing that, that doesn't really uh, implicate the author as having done these very things. You know, a lot of times when we write things, we kind of identify with our uh, subject by saying, you know, you know, let us do this, or, or we can do this, or when he, really the author is really trying to get the, the audience to do it, not necessarily himself. It's, so it's just a style of writing that tries to encourage the uh, author. So that's not a good excuse that that it's not Paul. <clears throat> uh, let's see. You know, all the things that are written in, <coughs> in uh, Hebrews well, he does say that, you know, we Christians uh, ought to give more earnest heed to things that we have heard. And then he uh, goes on to say, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. <coughs> God also bearing them witness, both the signs and wonders and divers miracles, miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Now this is not to say, the author is not trying to say that, that uh, he was not an apostle, <clears throat> that he had not seen or heard Jesus. Uh, he was merely just given secondhand reports <clears throat> uh, to those who had been eyewitnesses of the majesty of uh, Jesus himself. <clears throat> and again, it's a, it's a writing style. It's you know you it, it's trying to connect with the uh, the audience. <clears throat> uh, 
It is also uh, urged as a, an objection, a third objection, if you will, against uh, Pauline authorship that uh, the writing somewhat partakes of the Alexandria. And you remember the, uh, the uh, city of Alexandria was a, a great center of learning and had a tremendous library, one of the greatest library that ever been collected in the uh, ancient world. Unfortunately, it was burned by fire, so all those manuscripts were lost. But a lot of the uh, students of the Bible, <coughs> thank you, a lot of the students of the Bible uh, learned, were educated in Alexandria. So they became known as the Alexandrian School. <coughs> and of course, if you go through a particular school, sometimes you acquire the uh, style of the educators in that system. And you be become known as, you know, whatever it is, University of Texas, you know, you become like them or uh, some other school, you, you become known as that type of school. So a lot of the uh, detractors from Paul as the author <coughs> say that had to be somebody uh, that uh, was educated in Alexandria, in the Alexandrian school, which Paul was not. But Paul was a very educated man. And uh, the problem is there's a lot of people of, you know, that are writers of the New Testament that write like those of the Alexandrian school. So scholarly learning is not limited to just uh, Alexandria. There are a lot of folks in that time that, that uh, had all the indices, if you will, of being educated in Alexandria when they were not. So that itself is not a good reason for the objection to Paul as the, uh, the uh, uh, author of the, this epistle. <coughs> It's also alleged that Paul would never have written an anonymous letter. Um, again, you have to look at the circumstances. You know, remember that Paul was a an apostle to the Gentiles, and we will cover you know who the audience was, but we can say here that it was primarily uh, Hebrews. That's why they call it Hebrews. It's primarily to them, and Peter was the apostle to the Hebrews, and the way they described that, uh, Paul was the, uh, uh, or Peter was the uh, apostle to the circumcised, and then Paul to the uncircumcised, the Gentiles. So here comes a letter addressed to the Hebrews, uh, ostensibly to the Hebrews, and you want them to read it. Now, is Paul going to say, like he does his other letters, this, I am Paul, I'm writing this to you, so you won't uh, abandon the, the uh, Christian faith and go back into uh, Judaism? That probably would not have gone over that well. You recall that uh, when he was in Jerusalem and he uh, was given the opportunity to defend himself for the, the Jews, and of course, he conversed with the centurions in in Greek, and they were amazed that he knew Greek. And he asked to be able to address the uh, crowd that was, you know, had the hanging rope for him. And he spoke to them in Hebrew, and they were surprised that he spoke to them in Hebrew. And that quieted them down. And they were very calm until he said that he uh, was had gone to the Gentiles, was going to the Gentiles. And that then created another uproar. And the centurion had to take him away and, uh, and took him down to Caesarea to, to prevent him from getting lynched. But you see the reaction that people had to someone that was uh, preaching 
to the Gentiles, they would have none of it. So that, you know, that could be a very good reason why uh, uh, this is, quote-unquote, an anonymous letter. But you know, if you look towards the end of uh, the uh, letter, he uses a, uh, a farewell address similar to most every other letter that he wrote. And since I don't have my Bible here, I can't uh, read it to you, but you look at the very end of all his other letters, and then look at the end of, of uh, Hebrews, is very similar. And some, by, some have said that is the, the secret code in Hebrews to give evidence that uh, he actually wrote it. <clears throat> Milligan goes on to say that the uh, <clears throat> simple fact that the uh, epistle is anonymous, given all those things that I've just said, is uh, presumptive evidence that it was written by Paul. It must be presumed that it was written by Paul. Because, the, you, know, you know, this is not normal for letters not to have the uh, author noted within the letter. <clears throat> so it has to be some reason why the author decided not to do that. So that's why it's, it's considered presumptive that uh, Paul, who had very good reason not for doing it, to not in include his name there. You know, Paul was a very uh, educated man, very scholarly, and his writing style was uh, beyond that of, say, the writing of Peter or, uh, say, Marcus and the others. Luke, was being a physician, was a very good writer. But Paul was a... An, an excellent writer had his own style, <clears throat> but the uh, style of of Hebrews, even though it's not exactly like the style of the other letters, is still on a, an intellectual and scholarly level, um, much beyond some of the other uh, writers of the New Testament, and some of his uh, style, you know, he would. He would uh, go from sometimes one subject to another. He would start a, a line of thought, then leave that line of thought and go to something else, and then come back to that line of thought later. He, he's done that in, in some of his other works, and that is what happened in, in Hebrews also. Uh, if you look in the, uh, let's see, the... Uh, Second chapter, <clears throat> he breaks off from his uh, the regular line of argument he's making there about the superiority of Christ, and he returns to it again in the uh, uh, the fifth verse. He, he, he begins it and then drops it and comes back again again in the fifth verse, and uh, again he comes back to it again in the fifth chapter, <clears throat> and uh, here he breaks off after the word Melchizedek in the 10th verse and doesn't return to this uh, subject until he reaches the beginning of the 7th chapter. That's very typical of, of Paul. So there are other examples and illustrations to be used, but this is very typical of Paul. <clears throat> and there's certain expressions that he uses that, that uh, would indicate that it's written by Paul in chapter 13, verse 23, he talks about Timothy. Know, that, know you that our brother Timothy is uh, set at uh, liberty, with whom he will, if he will come shortly, I will see you. So there's an ex expectation that 
whoever the audience is that the author expects Timothy to be released and he, he himself expects to be released and to be, uh, come see them shortly. So who is it of the writers that we know of that has been in prison and expected to be released? What well, is Paul? Uh, in fact, he may have had a couple of imprisonments. The first time may have been released and imprisoned again and expected to be released, but he was never released. So that's a good indication that uh, the author is Paul. <clears throat> um, Timothy, of course, was sort of like a son to Paul, and he, he was a great help to him, and, and almost, not always, but almost a constant companion. He was with Paul in Rome and uh, during his first imprisonment and, and uh, uh, also from his other letters, you know, it's evident that he was uh, uh, associated with Timothy. Timothy was a good companion to him. <clears throat> so when he mentions Timothy in this Hebrew letter, even though the author is not named, who could be Timothy's companion? Well, it's uh, again presumptive that it's Paul. <clears throat> and it says in chapter 13, verse 24, uh, this is addressed to the Hebrew brethren, they of Italy salute you. Well, then now that may indicate that uh, Whoever wrote this was in Italy at the time and uh, was sending the greetings of the Italians to whoever the audience was, and it, it apparently was the Hebrews because of the uh, title given to the, the book. Now, some of the detractors say, well, <coughs> it could actually be written in, say, Palestine, Jerusalem, something like that. And there could be a little group of Italians there. And he's sending this letter to Rome. And he wanted those little, little group of Italians uh, there. They were expats from Rome. He's sending their greetings back home. Uh, you know, you could make a case for that, I suppose. But that's not likely what the uh, Greek is, is saying. It's most likely saying that I'm here in Italy. I've got brethren around me because, you know, Paul did convert a lot of people there in, in Rome. And I'm, they want to send their greetings to you just as well as I want to send my greetings. So <clears throat> that's probably the case. It's more likely than the other way around. So that would be, again, a reason that Paul should be considered the author of Hebrews. Now, <clears throat> as I said before, that the, the Hebrews, uh, they could have been an amanuensis that actually, you know, put it down on paper, if you will, with Paul just doing the dictation. That could be, and if it, uh, uh, if Luke, some surmise that he was the amanuensis, and it would have, uh, you know, obtained some of his style, Luke's style, in the manuscript, even though the, the thoughts and, and the dictation was uh, Paul's. Well, that uh, could very well be. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, even though that could modify the style of the, the, uh, of the writing, the testimony of the Christian fathers that were closest to the time that the uh, book was written, that is much more persuasive than uh, any of these other things that I've mentioned. They believed it was Paul. They were closest to the actual writing. And so therefore, I think uh, we should also accept the fact that you know, Paul was the writer. I don't have any problem at all that 
in, in saying uh, when you talk about somebody uh, quoting the uh, Hebrews, just saying that the author of Hebrews wrote this, <laughs> just let it go with that, because even though I even though I think it's Paul, uh, you know, we may never know conclusively until uh, that you know after the day of judgment. By that time, we won't care. <laughs> so anyway. <clears throat> Now the important thing is, uh, regardless of who the author is, uh, should it be included in the uh, canon of the New Testament? Should it be included as part of the New Testament? Again, it wasn't uh, by the uh, Western churches for about 400 years, and uh, well, uh, uh, in the last time about 300 years, because supposedly it's written close to the turn of the century. Um, so it's, it's probably. Um, three or four hundred years before the Western churches actually accepted it also. But there are many uh, oh, church leaders, if you don't call them that, that never did accept it. Uh, Luther did not accept Paul as the author. But the problem is, if you're going to accept it as part of the New Testament, which a lot of churches did, even though they had rejected Paul as the author, you got to have somebody that's inspired, because you can't have a, a part of the New Testament canon without it being an inspired book. You can't have that. And if it is written by uh, an apostle, uh, apostle, and accepted by the churches, then you have to say conclusively that it should be part of the uh, New Testament canon. So, and there's. Um, evidence for inclusion in the New Testament canon one is that again if Paul wrote it it's I don't care if uh, Luke was the manumentions or not if Paul wrote it then it's going to be included in the uh, uh, New Testament as part of the uh, New Testament canon because it would be probably be both inspired and uh, canonical as they, they say it <coughs> Another reason is that <clears throat> the epistle Hebrews was quoted as scripture uh, and used as such by the, the churches for many years uh, prior to the cessation of miraculous gifts. And like I say, I don't know exactly when miraculous gifts ceased. I know that after the last apostle died, there were no more gifts uh, the miraculous gifts given out, but those that already had it, uh, you know, they would retain it until they died. And when that is, it probably quite some time after the uh, last apostle died. But when that is, I don't know. But it apparently some of these early church fathers that that uh, uh, said that this was written by Paul and it should be included in the canon of, of the uh, church. They were living at the same time that these people who still had miraculous gifts uh, were still living. And if it was not to be included in the canon, then it is likely that those who had the gifts of knowledge would have said so, that it should not be included, but they never did. There's no writing from anybody that said it should not be included back in that time, that it should not be included in the New Testament canon. So the fact that uh, these uh, church fathers, if you will, who lived at the time that there were still miracles, uh, no apostles but miracles, uh, they were quoting Hebrews. So that's a good indication that it was indeed considered part of the New Testament canon. And I think we can have confidence uh, today that it in fact should be. Well, we'll have to continue, uh, continue with this uh, next time, and then we've, we've got to consider uh, where th this epistle was written and, and when it was written, and to whom was it written. And another thing we need to consider, how did it get its name? It's, it's not mentioned anywhere in the, in the uh, epistle. Not in the, that's unlike the other epistles of Paul. 
Nowhere is the word Hebrews used in Hebrews. So how did it get its name? Uh, those are all things that we need to consider, uh, interesting to consider, and we'll do so. Maybe not next time, but maybe the next time after next time when we finish uh, my, uh, the minor prophets. Thank you.